We thank you, our Father and our God, for the opportunity to seek your face in this season. We ask that the entrance of your word this evening will bring light and understanding to the simple. We thank you for hope and encouragement that your people will receive online today as we gather at the foot of the cross. And for ever, everyone who will watch and listen to this message hereafter, we thank you that they will be richly blessed also. We give you praise as we deploy technology for this purpose and we receive right now inspiration, illumination, and revelation. Thank you, Father, for the grace to preach, the grace to hear accurately, and above all, for every one of us, the grace to be dwellers of the word and not just here as a Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Today, will we continue with our theme, in the days of his power, his people will be willing. Our focus is the role of the Lord of hosts in spiritual warfare and the governance of nations. That appears long, but it captures everything that we'll be doing today, tomorrow, and next tomorrow by God's grace, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. The role of the Lord of hosts in spiritual warfare, and the governance of nations. You recall that on the first day of October, the day this solemn assembly began, we touched a little bit on this subject. I would like you to turn your Bible with me uh, for an in-depth study before prayers today. To Psalm 24, I'll read from verse 1 to 10, and then Psalm 46, 1 to 11. Psalm 24, 1 to 10, and then Psalm 46, 1 to 11. He reads, and I quote, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who, be questioned, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. <laughs> this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts is the king of glory. The Lord of hosts is the king of glory. Now Psalm 46, 1 to 11. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there's a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the pier in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Aren't you glad, brothers and sisters, that the Lord of hosts is with us and the God of Jacob is our refuge? Before we launch into the deep, please join me in thanking God wherever you may be at this moment 
for the privilege of seeking God's face. It's a great privilege. Not everybody does and not everybody can. But when we come before him to seek his face and not just his hands, let us know inside of ourselves that this is a unique privilege. Give me some 24 verse 3 to 6 again. Look at it. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? Please understand and let us see the questions of who can approach God or come to his holy hill. He who has clean hands, how clean are your hands and my hand? And a pure heart, how clean is your heart and my heart? Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He who fits those conditions, who fulfills those requirements, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And all of a sudden, in the middle of all these conditionalities and the blessing that will follow, Jacob appeared. This is Jacob. And the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Let me spend some quality time in explaining this point of prayer to you. Thanking God for the grace to approach him and to seek his face. Especially the blessing of being chosen by God and being allowed to approach him in prayers. You and I know that, but for the love and grace of God extended to Jacob, he was not a perfect man. Neither was he good enough to ascend the holy hill of God or to come into his presence. The conditions are stipulated, and we have read it again and again. Now, how did Jacob enjoy this privilege after taking advantage of his hungry brother? And that in collusion with Rebekah's mother, just to rob Esau of his birthright blessings. We know that Jacob was a cheat and a supplanter. But when the payday for his misdeed came, sowing and reaping, for as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall never cease. He sowed, the time of reaping had come. When that day, the payday came for his misdeed, God, the Lord of hosts, step into a situation first by sending an advanced team of angelic warriors as the Lord of hosts. He sent an advanced team of angelic warriors to Mehenim, which means double camp. Let's read that story in Genesis chapter 32, verse 1 to 2. So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanim. This is God's camp. Aren't you glad tonight? Aren't you grateful? That the angel of the Lord encamps around the saints to deliver them. That just as mountains surround Jerusalem, the Lord is there surrounding his people to deliver them. I want you to pray. You may not see physical angels or see them in manifestation. But the truth is, at all times, in all seasons, God has sent them forth to minister to us as heirs of salvation, even before we got born again and thereafter. He saw the camp of angels, and he called the place Mahinim. We thank God for the role of the Lord of hosts in our lives, especially the role that he played when our self-inflicted battles will begin. How many battles he had fought on our behalf without us knowing. We give you glory, God. We give you praise. We give you adoration. We thank you because you're a man of war. You see it in advance before they will come. And you finish many battles before we get to know. We just step into the place of victory and move from victory to victory. Thank you, Father. Receive glory and praise today in Jesus' mighty name. Please note that despite the contingent of the angelic army, sent ahead by the Lord of hosts to calm down Jacob, he panicked and his nature took over. The Bible states that he was greatly afraid and distressed. Therefore, he kneeled on his own understanding and used what you call native intelligence to prepare for the worst ever that could happen to him and this, he did not even consider prayer at this time. He had already done all those. Then he prayed to God, 
when the messengers he sent to his brother Esau came and reported to him that Esau was coming to Jacob with 400 men. Come on. I could imagine him, uh, imagining these 400 men ready for war and ready for battle. <laughs> fully equipped and fully armed, Jacob must have concluded that Esau was on a revenge mission. Let's see what happened to him before he even thought of praying at all. Genesis 32, 3 to 13. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my Lord Esau. Can you imagine? When you have robbed someone and you have cheated them, they become master over you. Speak thus to my Lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I've dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. That's over 21 years. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants. And I've sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. Then the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. I did not know how they counted the 400. I did not know what happened, whether they were really 400 or not, but suddenly we knew there were 400 men coming with Jacob. I want you to remember that if you still have a conscience, it will convict you. You remember what you did to the man, how you robbed him, and trouble will start. Let's read further. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. He said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. Can you imagine? Angels were already standing there about to take instruction if Esau will misbehave. But Jacob, his natural nature began to think of the trouble that will befall him. He panicked. And after he had divided them into two camps, then he remembered prayer. And we like him. We will try everything else. Prayer will be the last result. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. Did he not, does he not mean his word? Didn't he mean it by sending angels in advance? He forgot all those. And then he began to humble himself before God. I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I cross over this Jordan with my staff. Now I become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, come on, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said I will surely treat you well. And make your descendants as the sand of the sea. We cannot be numbered for multitude. So he lord there that same night. And took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. How many times have you and I, like Jacob, lean on our understanding without praying for divine direction and then we'll bring problems upon our own heads. Thank God tonight that in such situations, God has always pitied us. He has always pitied us. This is, this is beyond uh, being sympathetic. <laughs> it's beyond just, uh, you know, he, he pitied us. Look at them. They will go contrary to instruction and then when things fire on them, then they will pray. Why does he pity us? Psalm 103, verse 10 to 14. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy, not just his thoughts, not just his ways. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our But his mercy toward us, those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. I will never be ungrateful to you, Lord. Oh, I will never be ungrateful to you, Lord. Oh, never. Oh, never. I will never be ungrateful to you, Lord. I want you to sing that with me today. I will never be ungrateful to you, Lord. Thank you for pitying us. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. I will never be ungrateful to you, Lord. Oh, I will never be ungrateful to you, Lord. 
Oh, never. Oh, never. I will never be ungrateful to you, Lord. I will never be ungrateful to you, Lord. Oh, I will never be ungrateful to you, Lord. Oh, never. Oh, never. I will never be ungrateful to you, Lord. Where you are right now, would you please thank God for your self-inflicted problems, things you've brought upon yourselves, that God Almighty in His mercies, as higher than the heaven, will come into your situation, reverse the trend, and give you victory in self-inflicted afflictions, self-inflicted problems. We thank you, Father. We bless your holy name. We give you glory and praise. Thank you for rescuing us from the jaw of the lion. Thank you for rescuing us from the grip of the wicked. Thank you for setting us free to proclaim your goodness and mercy to others that we come in contact with. To your name be glory and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. People of God, God allowed Jacob to do everything he was doing until he was alone. Then the God of love and grace appeared to him and wrestled all night with him after he crossed the fraud of Jabok. Jabok means empty, to empty someone. God allowed him to cross the fort of Jacob and then he appeared and wrestled with him all night in order to empty him, change his nature and his name. Change his name from Jacob, a cheat and a supplanter, to Israel, a prince with power. Let's read that in Genesis 32, verse 22 to 30. Genesis 32, 22 to 30, reason I quote, And he, Jacob, arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. <laughs> then Jacob was left alone, and a man with capital M wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. Can you imagine his, 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 his perseverance? His, his, his doggedness, he was wrestling with God. And he would, he would God, more or less, was saying he would not prevail. It's like you playing with a little child that he thinks you can over, he can overcome you. He touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. You may be in a situation today that you are bedridden because God wants to deal with you in the name of Jesus. As you turn to God and devout yourself of every form of bitterness, anger, acrimony, hate, and every evil thing you have ever thought of. May God show you mercy and restore your health and bring you back from the place of death and grave in the name of Jesus Christ. God Almighty removed his joint. Sometimes in order to save you, God will have to go the extra mile to break your jaws. And he said, let me go. God said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. You remember our song? I won't let go. I won't let go. I have Jesus. I won't, I won't let go. I, won't let. I hope that's your faith attitude tonight. Don't let go. So he said to him, what is your name? This is the real issue. He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. But Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is that? Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. He empowered him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. I pray that in this season of our waiting on God, a fresh life preservation encounter. My life is preserved. I've seen God face to face. I pray that a fresh life preservation encounter with God will happen right now in the midst of the challenges we face as a nation and as a people of God. Those challenges are everywhere in the world. It's not peculiar to us. Let's pray that as we seek His face, we'll have a life preserving encounter with God in the name of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, but for God, the story of the encounter of Jacob and Esau would have been different. See what happened contrary to the revenge mission that Jacob envisioned. 
Genesis 23, verse 1 to 11. Oh, I bless God. Every time I've read this, I bless God. The, every, you, you think the worst is about to happen, and God intervenes. And from darkness, He will command light to shine in the midst of your situation. Genesis 23, 1 to 11. Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were 400 men. How did he count them? <laughs> so he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front. That's Zilpah and Bilha, all right, sons of slaves. You go forward. Leah and her children behind, uh -huh. sons of the hated woman, sons of competition, follow. And Rachel and Joseph last. All he was thinking is, if you will kill some, some will escape. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times once he came near to his brother. That's what you get by teaching, by cheating others. When he wore Esau's garment, if you have read your Bible, and the father smelled the garment of Esau, based on that smell of the garment of Esau, the father pronounced blessing. Your brothers will bow before you. You think you received a blessing. Now he's paying for it. He bowed seven times before Esau. But rather than Esau attacking him or any of the 400 men, Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Thank God for divine intervention in your situation tonight, in the situation of your business, in the situation of your family, your children that are torn away from you and have gone far away from you. God is able to bring them back. Your children will be taught by the Lord and great will be their peace. Your brothers will hate you and that you, you will come together again because God does not want to strike your family with a curse. It will turn the heart of the fathers into the sons and the, son, the heart of the sons to the father so that no curses pronounced upon you. And he lifted his eyes. That's Esau. And said the women and children and said, who are these with you? Introduction time. So he said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Now he didn't tell the story about Rachel uh, was the love of his heart and how Leah was packaged instead. Now he didn't go into all that. He had forgotten. He had put that behind, behind him. Come on. Then the maid servants came near, they and their children, and bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Then Esau said, what do you mean by all this company which I met? The gifts he sent ahead. And he said, these are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. Come on. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. I pray that Esau will not judge this generation that lacks and that does not know how to connect God because despite all his blunders, he still could tell his brother, I have enough. May God change the situation of your life today that you not become a shame or a reproach to him and you'll be put to shame because of lack. Esau said, I have enough. This was a man who did not have any restraint, who could not restrain himself, who was guided by his flesh and, and, and could sell his birthright. But at the end of the day, he received dominion and broke the yoke of his brother upon his neck. And in the, in the name of Jesus tonight, I pray that you receive the same dominion and break every yoke of your life so that you can tell others that you have enough. So that I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, no, please. If I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand. In as much as I have seen your face, as though I have seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. If you look that in the meaning, in the center of your Bible, I have enough means I have all, I have all. So he urged him, and he took it. I'm so glad to announce to you that God knows how to turn the negative things of our history into the positive things of our destiny. Let that sink deep tonight. God knows how to turn the negative things of our history into the positive things of our destiny. Can you imagine Esau saying, I have enough, that's by selling his birthright. And can you imagine all the trouble that Jacob envisioned that with 400 men, Esau will wipe his clan, his tribe, his, his, his descendants off. But that did not happen because of divine intervention. I want you to release your life 
and all the negativities about your life, what people said to you, what you did wrong, oh God, I want you to release them into God's hands today because it's able to turn the negative things of your history into the positive things of your destiny. Hallelujah. Thank God that he, almighty God, chose Jacob and allowed him to approach him just as we have the opportunity to seek his face in this season. It's a privilege. I didn't just wake up and say, church, we must fight. No, he led me to call for a solemn assembly for the first 15 days of October. I do not have all the nitty gritty of what he wants to do, but I trust him. And I call for this fast, and you are joining us in the name of Jesus. The blessings and the benefits of it will be your, your portion, full measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over in the name of Jesus Christ. Why is this a great privilege? This is why I started this meeting this way. This is why we kick off in this manner. See the privilege that comes along with being chosen by God and being allowed to approach him. Psalm 65, verse 1 to 5. Psalm 65, verse 1 to 5. Praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion, and to you the vow shall be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Thank him for answering our prayers. You will hear all prayer. To you will all flesh will come. But see the problem. Can all flesh really come? Iniquities prevail against me. <laughs> As for our transgressions, you provide atonement for them. So if your transgressions will hinder you from approaching God, there's atonement tonight by the precious blood of the Lamb that was shed on the cross of Calvary. And now read verse 4 and 5. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you. It's a great privilege that he may dwell in your courts. We, those who approach God in that manner that are chosen, we shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. By awesome deeds and righteousness, you will answer us. Oh God of our salvation, you who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of the far off seas. Lift up your hand wherever you are and thank him for the privilege of access that by the Holy Spirit, by the sacrifice of Jesus, by the shed blood on the cross of Calvary, we can approach him this day and present our petition and receive answers by awesome deeds. He will answer us in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for this privilege. We bow before you, we adore you, we glorify your holy name. But thou exalted, O Lord, above the heavens and let your glory fill the earth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Now we can proceed to the role of the Lord of hosts in spiritual warfare and the governance of nations. The role of the Lord of hosts in spiritual warfare and the governance of nations. It's important that I make this plain and critically clear to you so that when I say the Lord of hosts is with us, you understand what we mean. The first point I would like to make in this connection is that the battles and the judgments of the Lord of hosts are always fought or carried out with precision. I'd like you to, to be precise and write precision boldly. If the Lord says he will bless you, he has precise ways of doing it, but you need to seek his face. Put that in your spirit. The battles and the judgments of the Lord of hosts are always fought or carried out with precision. To prove this point, let us go to Psalm 46 again. But before we read the first three verses, I would like us to read the title of that psalm. The title reads, God, the refuge of his people and the conqueror of the nations. In spiritual warfare, when it he invites us to come and we are presenting, uh, we are pres and in his presence, we are presenting our petition this way. You know that you have come to the conqueror of nations where God cannot rule, he will overrule. He rules in the affairs of men. He gives it to whosoever he wills. He's sovereign God. And when his people come to him, no matter the difficulties and the challenges and the situation, the conqueror will rise to his feet, to do what is needful to deliver his people. Part of the title now reads, this is where I'm coming, to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah, 
I sang for Alamoth. Come on now. Sons of Korah wrote Psalm 46, 1 to 3. Let us read what is written there. The sons of Korah wrote, and they turned it into song by sending to the chief musician. God is our refuge and strength, huh? a very present help, not later, not before, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with swelling. Come on now. By the time you get to verse 7, they gave the conclusion. The God of Jacob is, is our refuge. The Lord of hosts is with us. What was it that informed the fearless attitude of the sons of Korah? Though they had been removed, they said, and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, and the mountains shake with his swelling. What informed their fearless attitude that they will not fear? Well, we need to dig into the ancestral history to find out their miraculous escape from disaster on the day God's judgment fell precisely with precision on their ancestors as the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up. Number 16, verse 1 to 16. Now, Korah, the son of Isa, the son of Korah, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the son of Pelet, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose before, up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation. They have been grumbling behind the scene. Now they wanted to carry out their rebellion. That happens in every community, every church, anywhere. Representatives of the congregation, men of renown, they gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourself, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Hey, envy. So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. And he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near to him, as we are doing now, as Jacob did. That one to whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this, take censors, Korah and all your company. Put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel? to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them. And that he has also brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? You want more? You don't have enough? You don't know what is your portion in all this matter? Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abraham, the sons of Eliab. But they said, we will not come up. They were defiant. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? That you should keep acting like a prince over us. Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey. Every promise you have made it has not been fulfilled. You have not given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of this man? We will not come up. Come on, audacity. Then Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they as well as Aaron. Let me go to verse 20 to cut this story short in righteousness. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When they gathered, all of them came. <laughs> he said to Moses and Aaron, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Then they fell on their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? One rotten apple had influenced a, a cart of apple, 250 men, plus uh, uh, some of them uh, added to them to kick against constituted authority, the plan and the purposes of God. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, 
speak to the congregation, saying, Get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of this wicked man, men, touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, underline, with their wives, their sons, and their little children. <laughs> and then Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. I have not done them of my own will. If you run on a frolic of your own, you don't have the backup, you don't have the backing of the Lord. But if God sends you, no one can intimidate you. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, and you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them and the earth opened his mouth. I'm not sure you know the earth has mouth. <laughs> and swallowed them up with their households on the line and all the men with Korah with all their goods, with their households and all the men. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit the earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, Let the earth swallow us up also. You can become guilty by association. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Why did I go this route? We saw that in front of their tents, Korah did an Abiram, they gathered their wives their children, every member of their household, and the Bible now records, and their little ones. I just said to you, the first thing to know is that the Lord of hosts, whenever he fights his battles, whenever he judges, he does so with precision. Almighty God considered those little children. And this little one knew nothing about what these older people were doing. You would think the earth swallowed up everybody that day because they were all together. But look at Numbers 26, 9 to 11. Numbers 26, 9 to 11. The sons of Eliab were Nemuel, Dathan, and Abiram. These are the Dathan and Abiram representatives of the congregation who contended against Moses and Aaron in the company of Korah when they contended against the Lord. Next verse. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah when that company died. When the fire devoured 250 men and they became a sign. May you not become a bad sign in the congregation in the name of Jesus. But look at verse 11. Nevertheless, the children of Korah did not die. <laughs> they were there. The earth opened and swallowed up everything. In that little passion where they occupied, God allowed them to stay there. And now they could write later, if the earth be removed, if the mountains be thrown into the sea, we will not fear because the God of Jacob is our refuge. The Lord of hosts is with us. I want you to pray today that the God of justice who spared the innocent sons of Korah will spare you and your children in this present hour. Come rain or come shine in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to know that God Almighty is precise in his judgment, in his battles. No, the righteousness of a righteous man will answer for him in times to come, and the wickedness of a wicked man will pour upon his own head. Keep on thanking God that no matter where your children are sent to in different schools, they will not join the, the drugs of culture. They will not return home as drug addicts and prostitutes. The Lord will deliver them, and no matter what has happened to them, your children will be taught by the Lord and great will be their peace. And in their peace, you'll find peace in Jesus' mighty name. The second point I'd like to make, about, apart from the precision of the Lord of hosts and his judgment and his battles, the second point I'd like to make tonight is what I highlighted on the first day of this solemn assembly. Namely, our local 
the Awagongon local declaration. I want to say very humbly that you don't start imagining vain things that we are in competition with any person or we are criticizing any person. No, 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 far from it. By that declaration, we mean indisputably and unarguably that it is the turn of the righteous to reign in Nigeria with Christ. The time of the wicked has passed. They may try, they may struggle, they may put in all the weapons of war and chariots of war they have. It will not work in this season. I pray they will understand and read the handwriting on the wall that the season has changed, that we are in the Kairos season, that God will grant grace and favor to his people and he will bring them upon the throne. Please note very well that the greatest factor or the structure that will facilitate the reign of the righteous in this nation is the Lord of hosts. That's the strongest, the most powerful structure that anyone who God wants to use or choose or use in this season, you must have the backing of the Lord of hosts. You must be able to say, the God of Jacob is our refuge, the Lord of hosts is with us. A clear example of this is what happened to Joshua at the border of the promised land in Jericho. If you have read this story, they encountered one of the most fortified walls in history. It's on record a, a, a biblical history that is about six, six uh, 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 meters, no, not six meters, about six miles apart, I, I, I understand, uh, if I understand accurately, because horses were mounted on those walls going around the city to watch if the enemy was coming in. It was that big. It was that massive. And here was Joshua and the people that had just come out of Egypt face to face with this war. But before anything could happen, the Lord of hosts again had sent another contingent. The, the, the commander of the army of the Lord appeared to Joshua. Thank you, Father, for tonight. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 to 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man with capital M stood opposite, opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. I can imagine how long that sword would be. <laughs> and Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Because Joshua was a warrior, the Lord manifested to him as a warrior. And he said, No, but as commander, of the army of the Lord have now come. Not the commander of the people who are following Joshua. No, 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 not the physical army of Israel, an invisible army, but as commander of the army of the Lord have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? If this was an angel, he would have rejected it. Go to the book of Revelation. The John tried to worship. No, 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 don't worship me, worship God. This is the commander of the Lord's army himself. Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot. He said that to Moses before. For the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. End of story. In the passage just read, just as Moses endured seeing the invisible so that he could do the impossible, Joshua also encountered the invisible. I pray today that God will manifest himself to you, that you will know that you know that the God of Jacob is your refuge and my refuge. The Lord of hosts is for us. He's on our side. Now, God has said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, as he was bringing him into leadership, he said, as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. So, the commander of the army of the Lord came to take over Joshua's battle. That was what made that fortress called the walls of Jericho a piece of cake to the children of Israel. Pray tonight as you lift up your holy hands to God that Jehovah, the man of war, will answer our prayers today and send his invisible forces to rescue our nation from the grip of wicked politicians and the terrible people who are plaguing our nation in the mighty name of Jesus. What they swallow, they will vomit in this season in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Please note three important points after Joshua's encounter with the commander of the Lord's army. These are very critical. They will show you the precision of God in his battles and when he judges. 
Number one point, the Lord gave Joshua the winning strategy to bring the walls of Jericho down. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1 to 5. Now Jericho was securely shut up, come on now, because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the rams on, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Please hear me tonight. The great shout of the people is merely symbolic of their obedience to God. But at the same time, it became a signal to the invisible armed forces to bring the walls of Jericho down. Joshua chapter 6, verse 15 to 16. But it came to pass on the seventh, seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only, they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened, when the priest blew the trumpets, that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. You remember our song? Shout, for the Lord has given you. We, we, we shout and do everything. But I want you to know that if you are not in obedience, you can shout all you want to shout, and your voices will crack, and, and you lose your voice, nothing will happen. The shouting did not bring the walls down. Come on. Their shouting was their response to God's instruction. They were obeying God. It was a signal to the invisible army that brought the wall down. Verse 20 and 21. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Underline it in your Bible. The wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Verse 21. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both men and women, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. Thank you. Look, listen. If this was a work of any man, then everybody in Jericho is dead. But I want you to remember something. To see the precision way that God fights his battle and passes his judgment. This third point I'm making today will show you that clearly. Joshua chapter 6, verse number 20. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Reading that will suggest to you that everything about that wall has gone down. Mm. How about if I say to you that a part of that wall stood firm? Will you believe it? That a part of that wall did not fall at all? This is the precision of the Almighty. I want you to shine your eyes. And let me show you the part of the wall that stood. It was a part of the wall that carried the house of Rahab, the hallowed. Are you there with me? You want to read your Bible? The walls fell down flat, but it was a part because of the precision of God Almighty. The part of the wall that carried the house of Rahab did not fall flat. Rahab's house, according to the Bible, was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. But because of the covenant she made with the two spies, the portion of the world that her house was built on did not fall. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1 to 15. Joshua 2, 1 to 15. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Akashia Grove to spy secretly, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. Why did he spend two? Send two and not twelve. 
because two people brought good news in the past. <laughs> he tried to do it by sending two. And you see that Jesus also sent them out in twos. Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. That's what DSS should be doing in our nation, to know before an attack comes, God will help them in Jesus' name. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may, you may overtake them. <laughs> but she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flowers. The stalks of flowers was the harvest she had gathered from her, from her field. She covered the agenda of God with her harvest. She hid them with the stalks of flowers, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan, to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof, come out, and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us. Many people don't know right now what is happening in different political camps. The terror of the Lord has fallen on them, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. But we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Hog, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Don't write off anybody. Here was a Lahalot who could put things together and said, God must be with these people. Ordinarily, they would not be able to do this and began to honor that God. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I've shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brother, whether they were wrong, whether they did something wrong to him or not, did not matter. This household faith, household, I mean, faith for household salvation. Spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. So the man answered her, Our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land, that we would deal kindly and truly with you. Then she led them down by a rope through the window for a house, a house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. Why did not that house come down? Because God fights his battle with precision. Don't begin to imagine that when things happen, it must come to you. No! If the Lord, the God of Jacob is your refuge, and if the Lord of hosts is with you, no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. The enemy will fall upon his own sword and destroy himself. You can see, she dwelt on the wall. A house was built on that wall. And see what happened when the wall fell down and the remaining wall that was standing was that of, Judge, of Rahab's house alone that carried the house. It was with precision that they could locate the house and it, Joshua sent those who had been hidden in that house before to go fetch Rahab and her household out of that mess. Joshua 6, 20 to 25. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpet. It happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout and the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, all, all. Both men and women, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. But, come on now, but Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has, as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, our father, our mother, our brothers, 
and all that she had. So they brought out, out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. That will be the time that the wall will now collapse completely. For they burned the city and all that was in it with fire, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Why? That was their first fruit. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Covenant keeping God, there is no one like you. Alpha and Omega, oh, there is no one like you. Covenant keeping God, there is no one like you. Alpha Omega, oh, there is no one like you. Ah, covenant keeping God, there is no one like you. Alpha Omega, there is no one like you. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Regardless of what happened in this city or any other city, in this nation or any other nation where you may be today, may the covenant of God's protection work for you and your household as it did for Rahab all the days of your life in this season and beyond this season. In the mighty name of Jesus, pray that prayer yourself. Tap into the covenant of God for protection. The God of Jacob is with us. The Lord of hosts is our refuge. He is with us. He will deliver us from every harm, from every ex incantation, from every evil desire and designs of the wicked. In the name of Jesus, all the days of our life, look at how the world, the remaining world, the little world, kept Rahab's house. And begin to thank God tonight because you will benefit from the covenant that he has made with his people. Prayer point number two is so amazing that Rahab the harlot of all the people in Jericho displayed such a high level of faith for our household salvation. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Listen again to what Rahab had and made deductions from. And I've been telling you about things that will happen in this nation. I'm preparing you to get ready. Get ready so that you do not partake of the reward of the wicked. In Joshua chapter 2, 8 to 14, listen to Rahab again. Joshua 2, 8 to 14. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Can you imagine that the terror of you has fallen on us? And that all the inhabitants of the land are faith hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, faith comes by hearing. As we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Who took this harlot to catechism class? Was she part of apostolic learning school? No, she made deductions because eternity is written in the hearts of men. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I've shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true talking. And what was the true talking they gave to her? They say, this court, this Cord, scarlet cord, representing the blood of Jesus. Hang it on the window from where you are letting us out and let it remain there permanently. Why did they ask him to put that scarlet uh, 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 scarf or whatever it is there? Because they knew how the blood protected them in the land of Egypt and they know that the blood is still available. And today, as you are hearing me speaking better things than the blood of Abel. They recognized the house when they saw the red scarlet. And today the blood of Jesus will answer for you. We protect you in the name of Jesus. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Let's see the summary of all days in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30 to 31. Hebrews 11, 30 to 31. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were in circle for seven days. But by faith, that's what rescued her. Not cunning craftiness, 
not native intelligence, by faith. The harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. As you hear me tonight, I pray that faith will spring forth in your heart and you and all your household will not perish with those who do not believe. I pronounce blessings upon you tonight in the name of the resurrected Jesus. As you go to break your fast, you receive strength. As you lay down, you have a good encounter with God in the mighty name of Jesus. A great encounter, a life-preserving encounter that will keep you safe in the midst of the troubles that will befall the world and the nations of the earth. Thank you, Father. Receive all the glory and all the praise for tonight. Thank you for the word that has gone forth. I pray in Jesus' name that your people will take this into their heart and they will be calm and quiet before you in this season so that you can reveal to them and to us corporately what you're about to do. Thank you, Jehovah, the man of war. You fight your battles with precision. You pass your judgment with precision. And we know when the warm wind begins to blow, we are under your safe custody. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.